We are in a series of messages that we started some weeks ago about being game changers, and uh, Randy talked about that this morning. As we go through uh, this series, we're looking at how ordinary, common people, men and women, uh, who just came from regular walks of life, suddenly found themselves in a situation where God was calling them to something great. Now, some of them accepted the challenge very gallantly, and others were hesitant and, in fact, wanted to shove it off on someone else. But ultimately, in the 11th chapter of Hebrews, there is a list of men and women who were heroes of our faith only because they gave themselves over to what God wanted to see happen in their lives. And they became game changers. And so we're talking this morning about Joseph. We are uh, going to be concentrating on one verse in that Hebrews passage, uh, chapter 11, verse 22. And this is the seventh in our series on the game changers. The Life Application Bible says this about Hebrews 11, verse 22. It says, faithfulness is more than trusting in God. It is doing what he wants, regardless of circumstances or consequences. And God calls us to faithfulness. This whole series is about faith, but particularly there needs to be faithfulness on our part no matter what. And so with the story of Joseph in, in, uh, that's just mentioned in one single verse in, in this list of men and women who were game changers, we see that the emphasis for Joseph was placed on the fact that he was faithful. Hebrews 11.22 says, By faith, Joseph, when the end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions about his own bones. Basically, he was saying this, I've lived a long life. God has used me, but God is going to be sending you back and your descendants back to the promised land. When that happens, make sure I'm buried there. That's the attitude of a faithful heart and a faithful man. He knew that God had full control of the future. And so with that, we need to just take a look at Joseph's life. Uh, the odds were stacked up uh, against him for being that kind of faithful man with everything that had happened. And so let's first of all understand that in spite of family fights, Joseph practiced faithfulness. Now, are you aware that there are 12 gates in heaven? You know, when we hear about heaven and we see people tell stories about heaven or when a joke is told about heaven, who's the guy at the gate that's supposed to meet you there? Someone tell me. St. Peter. He's at the gate and he's welcoming you in or, or he's looking at his list. There's some, some situation where we see that you have this entrance through one gate and Peter, the apostle Peter, is there to meet you. That's not in the scriptures. In the scriptures... There are 12 gates, and each gate is carved out of a single solid pearl. And these 12 gates are named for the 12 sons of Jacob. Now, the, the verse I'm referring to is, is Revelation chapter 21, verse 10. It says, And he carried me away in the spirit on a mountain great and, and high, and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates. On the gates were written the name of the 12 tribes of Israel. The 12 tribes of Israel were named for the 12 sons of Jacob. I'll tell you, you must have really done something right to get a gate in heaven named for you. You must have really been a holy person. Wrong. The 12 sons of Jacob all had their problems. Some were terrible men. Some were more godly, but they all had their problems. So let's talk about the family struggles that Joseph had to deal with when he was dealing with his 11 brothers. We can begin with Reuben. Reuben. 
Reuben was the oldest one. He is more than a sandwich, folks. Reuben was the oldest child of Jacob, and he should have inherited the double portion because he was the firstborn. But he gave it up. He didn't give it up. He excluded himself because Reuben had committed adultery with one of Jacob's wives. And that threw out the promise. He was also probably supposed to be the one that would receive the patriarchal blessing. And through his line, the world would be blessed because he was the oldest. But he threw it out because he committed adultery with a stepmother. Also, he likely was supposed to be the priest, the one to lead. He threw it out because of his sin. And Levi was given that responsibility. The second son is Simeon. Now, Simeon had a sister named Dinah, and Dinah had gone out with some Shechemites, uh, a, a tribal people uh, in their day before, they, before the, uh, all of Israel went to, uh, to Egypt, and these Shechemites took advantage of her. Well, with his brother Levi, Simeon concocted a plan to retaliate. And he, he and Levi killed all the Shechemites. He was hot-tempered. He was cruel. He was vindictive. And Simeon was a mass murderer. And one of the gates in heaven is named for him? Let's go to the third son, Levi. Levi, except for his involvement with Simeon in this murder, in getting even uh, for the way their sister was mistreated, uh, Simeon was shown as a good man. And the sons of Levi were rewarded with the priesthood. The Levites became the pastors of, of the church of Israel. The fourth son was Judah. Judah, we're told, had a problem with wine. He was a boozer, and he was susceptible to it. The fifth son, Zebulun. Zebulun was really... A fine son. There wasn't really anything negative said about him. He was Leah's youngest son, and we're simply told he was a nice man. The sixth son was Issachar. Uh, Issachar was described as one who would be a bearer of burdens. In other words, he was going to be a hard-working man, and he would take a load off of your back and carry it himself. Dan was the seventh son, and he was the older of Joseph's two sons, um, and uh, uh, well, I should say he was, he was the older, well, he was the older of Joseph's two sons, and he was a good worker, and he was faithful. But Dan's descendants became idol worshipers. Number eight is Gad. We don't really know much about Gad, except that his name meant company. And by that name, Gad, meaning company, Gad was one who enjoyed being around people. He enjoyed popularity. He enjoyed parties and he was subject to peer pressure. The ninth son's name was Asher, and Asher means happy. He was prosperous. He was a blessed man, and people admired Asher. The tenth son was Naphtali, and Naphtali, we're told, was a good writer. He was a wordsmith, and as a side note, he settled, and his people settled I shouldn't say that he did, but his descendants, his tribe, settled in an area from which many of Jesus' apostles came from. And they also became good with words as they wrote the scriptures. The eleventh son was Joseph. There is not one fault mentioned in the scriptures of Joseph. Joseph was about as Christ-like as any person you'll find in the Bible. He lived for 110 years, and there is no record of any defect. He was a servant. He saved the Egyptians. He saved his brothers. He saved his people. And Joseph in the Old Testament was the best representative of Jesus Christ who was yet to come. And the last of these 12, the last of these 12 was Benjamin. He was the youngest. He was Joseph's kid brother. And we're told that Benjamin's name meant wolf and he was a self-willed child. So here we have a list of 12 sons of Jacob. And some were good and some were bad. Most of them had some serious problems. Among those men were mass murderers and adulterers and alcoholics. And when it came to their kid brother, Joseph, they were jealous. 
Joseph was, a, was, was the, the son that was favored by Jacob because he was the firstborn from Rachel. And Rachel, out of, Joseph's, out, out of Jacob's four wives, Rachel was the one he loved. And so Jacob doted on his son Joseph. The rest of the 11, they didn't like that much. And they were upset about it. And when, when Joseph received a coat of many colors, and they didn't receive a coat of many colors, they were upset about it. And finally, the straw that broke the camel's back came when Joseph said, You know, brothers, I had a dream. And in the dream, you will all eventually bow down to me. And in a rage, all the brothers grabbed Joseph, threw him in a pit, and had to decide what to do with him. Some wanted to kill him right there, and others said, no, we need to spare his life. And while they were fussing and fighting back and forth with each other about what to do with Joseph, another group of people came, pulled Joseph out of the pit, and took him off to Egypt as a slave. I, I, I need to, you, you to know that there can be family fights. There can be difficulties. There can be issues that we don't have very well resolved in our own households. But we need to be faithful. And really, when it comes right down to it, these people, these men, who some were very chillingly evil, had gates of heaven named after them. What happened? Well, they changed their lives. They let God start working in their lives. And we need to pray that God will change us and help us to have that same heart and that same attitude. In spite of family fights, there was faithfulness. But secondly, in spite of failed employment, there was faithfulness. And for Joseph, this whole thing came from the, the situation of him being taken a slave. He had favored status as his father's son, and now he's a slave. And yet we don't hear any cry of despair. We don't see any accusation. We don't hear any complaint. His silence indicates his character. He is trusting God, not trusting in the schemes of men or trusting in, in what his family might be able to do. We know that Joseph was stripped of his multicolored coat when he was thrown into that pit. But he wasn't stripped of his character. The person inside the coat, Joseph himself, remained true to God in the face of difficulties. Well, Joseph eventually was sold to Potiphar. Potiphar was a title that meant Pharaoh's man. So Potiphar was, was a man who had some high regard within the court of Pharaoh. And in his new surroundings, as the servant of Potiphar, Joseph became successful in spite of being a slave. And Potiphar saw that he was wise enough that he turned all of his administrative uh, 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 needs over to Joseph for the household. And Joseph uh, was one who managed nearly everything in that household with excellence. Now, in Potiphar's house, Joseph learned the Egyptian language. He learned culture. He le learned the politics of Egypt. And it prepared him for a future that would come in which he would be uh, given the title of the second highest official in all of Egypt. That was still down the road. But nothing in Joseph's life was accidental. We see God working through Joseph in every detail. And yet, after Joseph had been a slave, now we see that he's imprisoned. Not because of anything he did, but because he resisted doing something that was wrong. Potiphar's wife had her eyes set on this young man, Joseph. He was about 27 years old. And I'm sure he was a fine specimen of a man. And she wanted to seduce him. The temptation before Joseph wasn't anything new to humanity. We have to remember that God is the one who created sex. And everything God made was made to be good. It's only when things are abused and when things are misused that what is good becomes wrong. And the same thing applies to sex outside of marriage. Now, there was temptation. But the temptation itself was not a sin. Yielding to the temptation was the sin. 
Joseph was a slave, but he never was a slave to sin. And he did his best to avoid Potiphar's wife and to avoid her, her uh, egging him on. But, as we see, she wound up feeling slighted, and he wound up in prison because Joseph refused. Actually, because Joseph ran from the advances of Potiphar's wife. She was enraged, and she accused him of attacking her, and he wound up in prison. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 promises us something. When we face adversity, when we face trouble, Peter said, the Lord knows how to rescue us from our trials. And sometimes God is going to provide a door of escape and he has to actually push us through because it might not be a door we would want to go to. But the way to save Joseph's life was for Joseph to wind up under the protection of an Egyptian prison. And so let's understand that in spite of failed employment, Joseph proved himself faithful. As we look more at Joseph's life, we realize that in spite of forgetful friends, Joseph proved to be faithful. In Genesis 39, we're told that God was in prison with Joseph. He was there helping him. Once again, Joseph rose to the top. The guards in the prison recognized Joseph's character, and they recognized his abilities, and they put him in charge of the other prisoners. Well, that's where the story becomes interesting because Pharaoh had two servants, two workers in his, in his court that were both thrown into prison. One was the cupbearer and the other was the butler. And with these, or, or the baker, I should say. And with these two, they both had disturbing dreams. Joseph said to them, the Lord is the interpreter of dreams. Tell me the dreams and I'll tell you what the Lord says. And so the cupbearer had the dream and explained the dream to him. And Joseph said to him, God says you will be restored to Pharaoh's house within three days. And it happened. And when the cupbearer was being released, we're told in Genesis chapter 40 that Joseph asked the cupbearer this. He said, as you go, remember me when it is well with you and Please do me the kindness to mention me to Pharaoh so that uh, he can get me out of this place. For I was indeed stolen out of the land of the Hebrews. And here also I've done nothing that I should be put into this prison. Now you can almost imagine the cupbearer saying, Yes, sure I will. How can I not help the man who was able to help me? But guess what? The cupbearer forgot. And for two years, he forgot all about Joseph until Pharaoh himself had a disturbing dream. And then suddenly the cupbearer remembered this dream interpreter who helped him to see that his life was going to be blessed. And so he told Pharaoh about Joseph. Joseph was called. And Joseph properly interpreted Pharaoh's dream, which in fact saved Egypt from a famine. And Joseph became the second most powerful man in the country. Now, how did Joseph endure all this without losing faith in God? The, the, how did he avoid, avoid having the conclusion that God was only raising his hopes to crush him, that God was playing with him? Joseph, I'm going to make you the favored son of your father sold into slavery. Joseph, I'm going to make you Potiphar's head, uh, the head of Potiphar's household, accused of attacking the wife. Joseph, I am going to make you the one who is in charge of all the prisoners in this, in this prison in Egypt. Forgotten. But ultimately, Ultimately, we see that Joseph didn't become bitter. He didn't become vengeful. He didn't become angry. Even when people failed, when people disappointed, when people left him hanging out to dry. And neither should we. Neither should we. When people mistreat us or abuse us or neglect us or forsake us, when people accuse us, when people neglect us, 
us. We need to give strength to God. It is Isaiah who said this. Those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings as eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Joseph understood that God's ways were not his ways. And that God's timing, although we may think it's way off, God's timing is always perfect. And so in spite of forgetful friends, there is faithfulness. Finally, in spite of the finality of life, there is faithfulness. Again, Hebrews 11.22, the only mention of Joseph in this list of this roll call of faith points to the end of his life. When the end was near, he spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt. And he gave instructions about his bones. Joseph spoke about going home. He knew that Egypt was temporary. Now, they wound up living there, the, 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 uh, the Israelites, the Hebrew people, Joseph's descendants and his brother's descendants, wound up living under the crushing overbearing load of Pharaoh for 400 years before Moses came along and before they were released. But looking ahead into the future, knowing that at some point they would be able to go back to the land that God had promised them, Joseph said this, embalm my body and take my bones home. He wasn't worried about the finality of life. How do we deal with life's final moments? And then how do we deal with life and with death when death comes suddenly and when death comes tragically and when the rug is pulled out from under us because of some event taking place in someone else's life? Now, Thomas Dorsey was a successful performer in the nightclubs in Chicago. But as a Christian... Dorsey was urged to use his talents for the Lord, and so he started leading revivals and started leaving the nightclub scene. In 1932, he was invited to go to St. Louis and lead the music for a very large citywide revival, and while he was there, he received a telegram, and Thomas Dorsey's life came to a screeching halt. Let me let you hear Thomas Dorsey tell you the rest of this story in his own words. I don't know anyone that has written a song as heart searching as Thomas A. Dorsey. They come out of experience in him, that's what he says. There's no song that could equal Precious Lord. He wrote Precious Lord. He was discouraged, and his spirit was broken. There was a, a revival, and my wife was to become a mother. I went there with her, feeling that uh, she would make a lovely, lovely mother when I came back. I knew my people were well when I left home, and they sent for me to come to the door. I said, boy, I brought me in the telegram. Took it, read it, almost fell out. It says, hurry home. Your wife just died. I don't know how you would accept that. I couldn't accept it at all. And uh, a friend of mine put me in the car. Took me right home. I got home. I jumped out and ran in to see if it was really true. And one of the girls, you started crying. and said, Nettie just died. Died and it had just died and fell in the floor. The baby was left alive, but in the next two days the baby died. Now, what should I do then and there? No one try to even tell me anything that would so be soothing to me. But none of it's never been soothing to me from that day to this day. But a few fellas come by, get their name. I don't know what to do, and I don't know how to do. And uh, I just try to make my little talk to the Lord, but it was wasted, I think. And uh, I told the Lord some one thing, and then 
one of the other said, said, no, that's not his name. He said, precious no. He said, that's just son. He got several amens. Precious no. And ladies and gentlemen, believe it or not, I started singing right then and there. Precious no. Take my hand. Lead me on and let me stand. I am tired. I am weak. I Lead me home. Thomas Dorsey said he called God all sorts of names. He was mad. He was upset. You're doing God's work, and your wife dies, and then two days later, your baby dies. And because he was so upset, he was reminded. Don't call him those names. Call him your precious Lord. That's who he is. And that's what he does. I am tired. I am weak. And I am worn. Precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me home. No matter what, be faithful. Understand that if you're facing family feuds, understand that if you are facing forgetful friends, understand if you are facing problems with employment, understand if you're facing the finality of life, be faithful and be a game changer. Because without faith, it is impossible to please God. Let's be the men and women of faith that Jesus Christ needs today in this world. Things are upside down. Our Christianity is being challenged on every front. God simply says, be faithful. Be faithful. Would you make Jesus your precious Lord? And would you let him lead you home? We invite you to come to him today. If you're outside of Christ, we extend the invitation while we sing this song to make that commitment to come forward and name Jesus as Lord and obey him. You're precious, Lord. Be faithful. Let's stand together, and if you're ready to make a commitment to Christ, we invite you to come.